And good morning. So there's less of you in here, so you'll have to try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Well done. So glad to have you here and uh, glad that uh, I've got something to lean on because I had a little procedure done on Wednesday, and so I'll be preaching from down here. And appreciate your prayers, those of you who knew about it. And uh, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord today. Very glad to be here with you. Now, we have um, a few things I want to share with you before we get started. Uh, one is that uh, we have this thing called the connector. It's an email uh, that's sent out uh, usually every week or so, every other week maybe. And uh, in this last one, I, I described some of the things that uh, has been on my heart with regard to uh, this whole COVID uh, roller coaster ride that we're on. If you, did, if you did not receive that, would you uh, fill out one of our, our welcome cards or right in front of you and uh, let us know so that we can make sure that you're on that list. And also, if you have any prayer requests, uh, please put that on uh, that as well. But there, you know, we, we have in this world that we live in so many opportunities to divide. And as Christ followers, we need to set those aside because God has called us to unity. Unity in his son. And he brought his son in this world to seek and to save the lost, to bring us together. And so as we have opportunities to be together, we want to take advantage of those as much as we can. Amen? Also, uh, as, as those, uh, if those of you who are online, we have also a, a little uh, electronic comment card for you. You can fill that out as well, and we'll make sure that we get... Uh, the connector to you. Uh, and if you don't have email, uh, the, both of you who don't have email, uh, we also, we have uh, a way to mail that to you. So just ask for it and we'll make sure you get that. Amen? Amen. So as we uh, gather together, let's begin with prayer. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that uh, your spirit has called us together. As we heard that church bell peal through the community we're reminded of your call to gather your people together to pray to gather your people together to worship and to listen to your word to listen to uh, keep your covenants to keep your statutes that we're going to learn about today and to discover what it means to live the Christ-following life in a bitter world. We thank you, Holy Spirit, and we give this service to you as we worship the Father and the Son, and you as well as you lead us. It is in the name of Jesus that we can pray these things. And all his people said, amen. amen. Would you please stand? Oh 
Jesus. That song covers just about all the bases, amen? I mean, things we really struggle with. Are we seriously taking those things to God in prayer? Things that we're really thankful for and blessed with. Are we telling God, thank you? Every aspect of our lives, God intimately wants to be connected. And if, if we miss those opportunities, you know, someday it's said in there, someday we'll stand in glory. And, uh, you know, I want to I know that I've been connected to this Jesus, our Savior, and I know him. Amen. Well, it's, it's time to pray, and we've got a lot to pray about. And I'm glad that God knows these needs intimately, deeper than we can know. And anyone have an unspoken request, just lift your hand to God. And just, amen. God sees that and knows it. Father, as we come to prayer this morning, we're so glad that we come boldly because of the blood of Jesus, his death on the cross. You've made a way for us to enter into that holy place where you are. And your Holy Spirit helps us to pray this morning. We're so thankful for the the word of God that proclaims these truths to us. And we claim them this morning. We believe that Jesus lived among us and taught us how you wanted us to live. And he died on a cross for our sins. And we're glad, Jesus, for the blood. It covers our sins. So thankful that he rose from the dead that we might have life and life more abundantly. And the presence of your Holy Spirit is real. It bears witness with us that we are yours and we will forever be grateful for the presence of your spirit. We bring these needs to you this morning. Norm Gobley, Steve Williams, Teresa Catterley, Terry Sellers, Warren Doherty, Terry Gully, Joseph Gray, Noah Smith, Charlene McGrath, Robert Crank, Mark Exline, Jack Kemp, Kelly Motts, Sally Momorov, Butch Carmen, Sean Tooney family, Kenny Barkin, Jack Ward, John Reese, Dixie Lucas, Deanna Newman, Linda Ackley, Vicki Bowden, Linda Taylor, Grady Marion, Barb Coy, Bob Bryan, Brian Box Bowersox, Neil Thompson, Jennifer Wetzel, Elizabeth Oberly, Mike Shaw, Douglas Ankren, Betty Brown, Ron Doherty, Jane Clapper, Brett Dean, David Reynolds, and the foster system for children and families. Uh, we just uh, Lift these up to you and the unspoken requests that were lifted. Lord, you've seen them. Answer those as well, Lord, and help us with them. Uh, we Sympathy goes out to our dear Diane's family as they, the passing of her father. That was a hard thing, God, and we pray that you'd comfort them in this, in the passing of Mary and Lowry. And Shannon's family, the passing of his father, Glenn. We just pray comfort and help in, in these times of sorrow. We pray for Tim Thorne's family as they grieve his, just, just missing him being there. But Lord, we'd never wish them back here. They're in your presence whole and, and just, and just we're so thankful for the example that these have left behind. Help us to follow this Christ-like example with our lives. Lord, we pray today uh, for our local missions, Hannah's House 119 and the leaders, mentors for wisdom, safety, for the girls and their basic needs. We have global missions that are going on and they're feeling the pressures of financial and physical and spiritual battles that we face and some of them are even in the battle deeper than we could imagine and we pray for Dave and Barbara Miller. Zach and Esther Motts, Daniel Christy Kim, Tim and Colleen Stevenson, and Caitlin Smith. For our leaders, Lord, we think of Pastor Greg and we're so, 
Amazed that he's here this morning. Thank you for the touch that you have given him thus far. Continue to bring healing to his body. And uh, Sister Sherry, continue to touch her and heal her. Our church staff and board and council. Lord, we need wisdom. We need direction and discernment. And help them with this, Lord. Our country and our president and all our government leaders, servicemen, policemen, principals, teachers. Man, the list just goes on and on, God, and we're glad that you do not grow weary in all of this. You're longing to hear us. You say, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden. I've got a rest for your souls here. And we bring these to you because you are the God of all creation. You are our Savior. And we come to you boldly and ask that you hear these prayers and encourage us together as believers to continue to lift these up before you throughout the week. And in this service, make a change in our life that we'll go out and have something to tell someone. In Jesus' name, bless our pastor as he brings a message this morning. Looking forward to what you've laid on his heart. God, we are blessed and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, yeah. Amen. That was operator error. We're here. So I want to begin just reading the scripture that we're going to be in today. Uh, we have been going through the, uh, the story of the Exodus, and uh, we've been in it for a while. And the reason why uh, I think the Lord uh, led us there is that, you know, way, way back several years ago in April, remember how long ago that was? We had uh, Easter. Uh, and, and we were reminded of that story of Jesus presenting himself to the disciples a couple days after Jesus was crucified. And as he did that, they were amazed at looking at a resurrected Jesus and confronted with the reality that now they have to live the resurrected life. And so we've been looking at the story of God working in the, in the lives of the Israelites and we've learned a lot of lessons from them. Uh, and as we're gonna turn a corner here and we're going to learn what's called negative lessons, how not to do things. Okay, so if you get your Bibles out and go to Exodus chapter 15, we will understand what it means not to live a bitter life. Okay, I'll begin in uh, verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water, and, tw and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. May God bless us as we study his word today. As I mentioned before, uh, we're turning the corner. We're learning um, uh, opposite lessons. It's like opposite day, right? And so as we, as we learn uh, from the Israelites, I'm reminded of, of these motivational posters. Does, do, does anyone have them in their offices or in their homes? They probably have a picture of a soaring eagle right with success and then some pithy saying underneath that it's it's kind of like a horoscope it means so many things in so many different ways right 
But there's these also these uh, posters called demotivational posters, and one of my favorites is this one. Okay, so for those who can't see this, uh, it's a picture of a rusting hulk of a ship jutting out of the water. And the, it, it's entitled Mistakes. And it says it could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. <laughs> and unfortunately, again, as we, as we go to the Israelites and what they do and what they don't do, this is one of those lessons, okay? Now, I think as I said this, you probably have people in your life who, who have made their share of mistakes, and maybe they've come out of them, praise God, or maybe you've made your own mistakes and said, okay, I'm never going back there again. But we can learn from our mistakes, can't we? Okay, so as we do that, uh, we're going to talk about bitter versus better. Um, Sherry and I were talking this morning, she reminded me because uh, I had a similar experience. Uh, my mother had uh, baking cocoa in her cupboard. It wasn't like cocoa that you put in milk and it tastes good. It tastes what? Bitter, Bitter. exactly. And Sherry was telling me that she demanded that she taste this in her mom letter, and uh, she found out, yes, indeed, it was bitter. So you've all had, many of you, have had a bitter taste in your mouth. It's a saying, isn't it? But it means something. It doesn't taste very good. It's, it's something you don't want to continue. And so we're going to look at this bitter water and the bitter people that approached it and see how we might go better, okay? Be, become better. Let's look at the, we're going to look at the people, we're going to look at Moses, and we're going to look at the Lord. First, let's look at the people. Now, this is a picture of desperation. Now, I want you to, if you can, put your feet in the sandals of these people. They just celebrated a huge victory. You know, dancing uh, on the sidelines, on the, on the side of the shore as they watch their enemies being uh, vanquished, and now they have been led three days into the desert. Now, three days into the desert means that they've either had water, uh, ta or the, the reserves run out, or they've been thirsty for three days. We're not sure. But I've been told there's a rule of threes. You can last about three minutes without uh, air. You can last about three hours without adequate shelter and three days without water and maybe three weeks without food, something like that. So the three days mean something. They are in desperate times. Now, here's what I know about me. If I can deal with being thirsty, and I will go ahead and hold my tongue. But when I see those I love struggling with thirst, I may say something. Anyone else? You know, we don't want to see someone suffer. And I could, and again, trying to put our feet into the sandals of these that are walking along the, the wilderness, which also is another word for desert. So it's not, gonna, it's not like walking through Northeast Ohio in some national park right after it rained and it's green and it's lush. It's like, it's probably pretty dry, dusty, two plus million people, and they're all really grumpy. Okay, so we, we have a, a, a terrible situation right here, and we might want to give them just a, a, a measure of the benefit of the doubt. However, then they approach this water. Now, how many of you have approached something thinking that it will be one thing and found out it was another, and you were disappointed? Anyone else? Okay, those of you uh, who raised your hand, uh, thank you for admitting uh, that it's, it's a real deal, isn't it? Every day. And so I, I want to give these people the benefit of the doubt. They had expectations as they approached this water that it would be good. But uh, most scholars believe, especially in the area of the, of the country that they were walking in, it was probably brackish water. That is that fresh water that had a little bit of salt water making it bitter. And so their expectations were here and their, their hopes were dashed. Their attitude matched the water. A question for you. Would you have grumbled? Or would you have endured? So let's look at Moses. Moses, at least in this story and throughout most of the Exodus, does a great job as a leader. He didn't complain back to the people. He cried out to who? The Lord. That's right. And this reminds us that we are also looking for examples around us, like Moses. Those that are making the right decisions. 
This is what Paul wrote when he said, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. How many of us have been down bitter roads, but because of who we were with, it was better. You could be that better like Moses. And this behavior, by the way, is not limited to Moses. We see it all the way through the scriptures, especially a person named Jesus. He knew when to go to the Lord and to the Father, and that was every day. Mark 1.35, very early, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place. And there he prayed. Jesus sets the example for us as well. And this brings us to a, to a little uh, mini truth you can put in your notes. Leaders lean on the Lord. Leaders lean on the Lord. Leaders who are honest with themselves are willing to admit that they are powerless sometimes. And they need the power that is, in the, that is found in the Lord. Amen? Okay, so if you were Moses... Who would you cry out to? Who would you cry out to? And the Lord showed Moses what to do. Now, this is, I, I love digging in the Old Testament because you get little snippets of, of the New Testament in there, okay? And, and, and here's what it was. In the English Standard Version that I read for you, it said that the Lord showed him a log and told him to take that log and put it in the water. That word is actually tree. In fact, in, in the English Standard Version that I have, the, the footnote said, or it could be translated tree. It is the same word that we have in the Garden of Eden, the tree of eternal life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the same tree that we see in Deuteronomy when it says, cursed is the one who is hung on a tree. And it gives our eyes a little bit of an opening to understand what Peter was saying when he said in 1 Peter 2 24 he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds you have been healed when we see this tree and, I, and it may have been instead of like here's a log and I pick it up and throw it in the water it could have been there was a tree right beside it and God had him cut it down and as it went into the water it made it sweet again loved ones this is a beautiful symbol of the bitter life that could be made better through Jesus Christ the one who makes everything better amen amen so this cross this rough hewn bloody uh, tree took the bitterness of our sin exchanged it with christ's righteousness and took away our separation from god by his wounds you have been healed and that's worthy of an amen 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 all right let's go back to moses what did moses do moses did what he was told he not only went to the lord cried out to the lord but did what he was he was told and again, here's another little mini, mini lesson that we could, we could lean on here. I said before, leaders lean on the Lord. Leaders listen to the Lord. Leaders listen to the Lord. Loved ones, the best leaders are oftentimes the best followers. The best leaders know how to follow, and they know how to follow the Lord. The Lord then tests the people. Will you say that with me? Tests the people. How does he test them? He says this, if you do these four things, then I will do something for you. Let's look at these four things that he, he asked them to, to do. Number one is diligently listen. Say that with me. Diligently listen. In the Hebrew, it's actually two words together. This is, a, this is a literary approach with Hebrew. If you put two words together, it means it's really important to listen to those words. And so translation is diligently listen. It is actually Shema, Shema. If you've ever heard of the Shema, it's, it's Deuteronomy 6, 4, where it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jesus quoted that, right? And so here we see it twice, and it means that you are to listen with great intent I have, uh, by the way, had some in marriage counseling and premarital counseling, and we talk about something called reflective listening. Reflective listening. Has anyone else heard that term? Okay, reflective listening means as I say something to someone, they reflect it back, convincing me that they at least understood what I was trying to say to them. 
And this is what it means to listen to the Lord diligently. We listen to him with the intent to understand what he has to say. It's not like, uh, you know, sometimes we read the Bible, we get distracted, and something's on our phone, and, then, and we just miss the whole point. That's not what it is. It's diligently listen to the Lord, number one. Number two, do what is right in God's sight because he's watching and because he cares. He's not watching as some judge, judge ready to thwap you because you didn't do something right. He's watching you because he loves you. And because you know he's watching and that he loves you, you want to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord because you actually have a relationship with him. That's implied in this. The Lord has, from the beginning of our story, wanted a relationship with the people of Israel. He wanted them to be his people. So diligently listen, do what is right in God's sight, and then hear his commands. Now you're thinking, okay, what's the big difference between listening and hearing. I'm so glad you asked. Because here we have a picture, of, it's actually like a word picture, of taking the ear and expanding it out so that you could hear even more carefully. This is, this is the notion of trying to remove our, our distractions so that you can listen to what someone has to say. It's not just listening intently, it's removing the distractions around us so that we could hear his commands. That's three. Four is to keep all his statutes. All the commands that are ongoing, we keep them because God has called us to. So those are the four things he asks us from, and we're going to get into a little more detail in a few minutes. Then he goes into promises, two of them. I will not bring upon them what the Egyptians suffered. We've gone through that. There was ten plagues, awful plagues. He promises, if you do these four things, people of Israel then I'm not going to do that because I am the healer. Now, we have, how many people have had people in your lives or yourself that did not receive the healing that you thought you were going to receive? Anyone? Yeah. So this, the reason I'm bringing it up is sometimes we, we look at some of these passages and assume that everything, if I'm a Christ follower, if I do these four things or whatever, that everything's going to go peachy for me. That is not in the scriptures. That is not in the scriptures. No, and I found a, a wonderful phrase that I'm going to hold on to. That sometimes we think the reward for following his commandments is going to be a great life. And we might have a great life. It might be shorter. It might be longer. It might be full of trouble. It might be full of pleasant trees. It might, we don't know. Because that's not what the promise is. Here it is. The reward for following the commandment is the commandment itself. The reward for following the commandment is the commandment itself. It is the privilege of being commanded by the Most High God to walk in a way that's honorable to Him, to walk in a way that gives Him the glory. This is what God's called us to when He says, I'm going to be your healer. I'm going to be your God. I'm giving you these commandments, not for me, but for your own good. Amen? But each of us has the responsibility to, to respond in faith. And in this story, we learn that bitter is far more than water. No, bitter is a choice. Bitter is a choice that each one of us gets to make. And in your notes, bitter is made better through Christ. Bitter is made better through Christ. So I have a, a few questions. How many times have you experienced something tragic and wished you would have waited on the Lord? Wished you would have waited on the Lord? How many times have, have you reacted bitterly to a situation and realized you didn't have all the data? And maybe your, your regret, how you responded, and wish you could take those words and put them back in your mouth? Or redo, have a mulligan? So how can we avoid that? How can we avoid a bitter heart and a bitter life? Well, first of all, is, is to have the right expectations. To have the right expectations. Loved ones, God has always promised that trouble is going to be a part of our life. Isn't that a great deal? He doesn't pull punches. He didn't say everything's going to be peachy when they're not. The Lord you serve doesn't lie to you. And we think, well, that was... 
That's not in the Old Testament, that's in the New. It's in both. One of the memory verses I'm working on right now is Psalm 9, verse 9. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. He knows that some days we feel oppressed. Some days we might be going through trouble, and he's going to be with us as a stronghold. He's planning ahead. Psalm 91 has been quoted a lot during this pandemic. In Psalm 91 at the end, this is the Lord speaking. Because he, the one who's devoted to me, because he, the one who belongs to me, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. And here it is. I will be with him in trouble. Everyone who belongs to the Lord at one time or another is going to go through trouble. And not only does, does we, do we hear that in the Old Testament, we hear it in the New. Jesus himself said in John 16, but take heart. No, uh, in the world you will have trouble. Or another word, tribulation. In the, word, in the world you have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Have the right expectations. Uh, I was a consultant for some time, and I learned this consulting equation that I'm going to share with you. If you ever go into consulting, it'll be great for you. But in life, it's good too. You ready? Write this down. Perception minus expectation equals satisfaction. Perception minus expectation equals Satisfaction. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me give you an illustration. Before the pandemic, you went to a restaurant. And let's say you had everyone and their sister with you. You had like a, you know, a, 10 people. Sometimes that's hard to fit into a restaurant. Or in case of Bobby's family, he had like 20. <laughs> right? So you have a lot of people with you, right? And you walk in, and, it's, and they're like, oh, it's this restaurant you really want to go to. And, they, and as, they, as you go to the host or hostess, you say, how long is the wait? And she looks, how many? Ten? About 30 minutes. You ask around, we can wait 30 minutes. Okay? And so 30 minutes is, is the wait time. And then 20 minutes into it, she comes and says, oh, we got a table for you. Now, the expectation was low, 30 minutes. The perception was high, 20 minutes. That's what happened, the perception of what happened. And so the satisfaction is going to be positive. Everyone get that? Okay, now let's look at it differently. You go to a different restaurant, and they, they, you walk in, we get 10, like 10, we can do you in five minutes. Great. So you sit down, five minutes turns to 10. 10 minutes turns to 12, to 15, to 17. You're thinking, okay, where else can we go? 20, they say, I'm so sorry, Mr. Smith, but we do have your table ready. Fine. What's changed? Expectations. Our expectation was high. It was going to be five minutes. Perception is low. Our satisfaction is negative, loved ones. When we walk into this world with expectations, not that it's going to be a terrible day. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. But expectations that God is going to lead you through time so you're going to need him. Then you're going to be better prepared to need him. And better prepared to change the bitter into better. He even promises in James, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. You're going to go through some stuff. And God, as we in faith walk through that stuff, God is preparing us for something more. And why not do it in a better way? than a bitter way. The pandemic that we're in right now has shaken loose. That was what was already shaking. Shaken loose our trust in the security of this world and realize that we don't have security in this world. It's shaken the political structures and the economic structures. It's shaken our addiction to convenience. We want it now. Well, guess what? You don't get it now. It's shaken a lot in our lives. Let's set our expectation for challenges to come. And then, when they come, let's put our trust in the Lord. Put our trust in the Lord. That's the rest of Psalm 9, the next verse, rather. 
For those who know your name, put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, will have not forsaken those who seek you. You see, when you know the name of Jesus, the name of the Lord, remember what Jesus' name means. It means the salvation of God. When you know the salvation of God, the name of Jesus, then you trust in that salvation. You trust in the Lord. You lean on the Lord first. And I think that's some of the challenges that we have. We're not keeping those short accounts with God that we need to keep. We need to keep on our knees and pray. And you know those times when we mess up, that's those times when we fall into sin that we wish we wouldn't have? Guess what? The Lord has accommodated that in this way, that when we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Is that not a good deal? This is the one who loves you. Lean on him first. When you do not know what to do, go to him. And then, here's the four things. Listen diligently. Listen diligently. I've told you about the, the, uh, the, the word hand, remember? Listen to the word. And then we read the word, right? And then we study the word, right? And then we put it in our heads so that it's memorize the word. And then we meditate on the word every day. Listen diligently. Some of us are more aware of trends on social media and mainstream media of choice than our Bibles. Loved ones, this should not be. This should not be. Listen diligently. And then do what is right. Recognize that if you are in Christ Jesus, he gives you the Holy Spirit. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple because the Holy Spirit lives within you? That's a, that's a promise. So if you're in Christ, if you received him, then you are born again by the same spirit who has not only regenerated you, but is now sanctifying you to be holy and set apart for his purposes. Amen. Amen. And that Holy Spirit is watching. Why? Because he loves you. Now imagine if you're 16 years old and you just got your license and your dad is following you in his car. Okay, most of us would go, cut it out, Dad. But what if he wasn't following you to critique you? But he's following you because he cares so deeply about you, he doesn't want you to get in trouble. This is the love that the Holy Spirit has for you because he wants the best for you. He wants the best for you. So listen, do what is right, and then hear his command. Remember, expanding the ear, getting rid of distractions. It's the picture of a mother listening for her baby's breathing in the other room and telling her husband, shh, shh, shh. Okay, you can talk now. Anyone else? Where you, it's so important that you're not going to let anything get in the way of hearing his commands. It is the growing sensitivity to the Spirit's work in our lives that brings us closer to the one who saves us still. Okay? So we, we listen uh, diligently. We do uh, what is right in his eyes. And we hear his commands. And then we keep his statutes. Not statues. Statutes. And what does that mean? Okay, so remember, remember that uh, uh, Moses got a command from the Lord to go put a log in the, in the, in the sea, in the lake, whatever, the, in the waters of Mara. That did not mean every time he come up to a lake, he wanted to throw a log in the water. It was for that particular time. Everyone get that? Because the statutes are the stuff that we get that's ongoing. Okay? So, for example, um, he's given us ten commandments, not suggestions. Ten commandments, and those are ongoing. They're, they're, they're statutes. We keep them. We, he has given us, this, this body of believers, the command to have communion. Guess what? We have communion. He's given us the command to meet. Guess what we're doing right now? We are meeting online in the parking lot right here. So we keep his statutes. That means we worship, whether it's online, here, in person, when no, when no one else will. We have communion even when it's a little difficult. We figured out a way to do it. Praise God. We make disciples even when the ones we have made fail and disappoint us. You know, that was a command, a statute given by the Lord right before he ascended to heaven. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, 
Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Loved ones, he didn't say, okay, but just do it if it's not hard. Just do it if they don't disappoint you. Make disciples. And so that's what we do. We make disciples. We forgive others even when they don't ask for it. We love those, even those that excel at being unloving. And you know who, as soon as I said that, you went, oh, yeah, that person. We love others, and we listen and honor those even if we don't agree with them. That is what we're called to, and that is what it means, in part, to keep his statutes. Loved ones, God does not call us to a bitter life, but he calls us to a better life, eternal through Christ Jesus. It's an ongoing statement, a step of faith, an ongoing step of sanctification, being made holy, set apart for his purposes, so that we could be more like Jesus every day. In, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, uh, Paul has just talked about how, a story from, from this exodus, how uh, uh, Moses came off the mountain and his face was shining, and the Israelites were afraid. They say, put a veil over, over, their, over your face, and he did. And Paul was using that as an example. He says, you know, uh, they, they still have a veil over their face because only through Christ is it taken away. But through Christ it can be taken away. So, and here it is, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Stop right there. Who are we being transformed into? What image? Starts with J. And Jesus, that's the image. And we're all seeking to be transformed in that image. And here's the part about being better. From one degree of glory to another. If you ain't dead, you ain't done being formed into the likeness of the Son of God. This is the ongoing being better instead of bitter. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In your notes, bitter is made better through Christ. You know, um, I haven't talked about that last verse that we read back a few moments ago in Exodus 15. Exodus 15, 27. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. You know what? <laughs> it's, it's, especially this week, you know, we had three saints pass you know, we had uh, Shannon's dad, Glenn. We had Diane Walker's dad, Marion. We had Tim Thorne, who, who finally uh, was victorious over a very long battle with cancer. All three of those men love Jesus. And they have entered into Elam, if you will. This place of rest that's waiting for each one of us. Where there will be streams of living water pouring. There will be... Uh, the, the, the symbolism of the, of the palm tree providing shade. This is the Lord's blessing that he's giving to each one who calls upon his name and overcomes to the end this place of rest. Now, in this story, again, we start with mistakes, right, that they were making. We know that they were chosen, the people of Israel were chosen, and we know that most did not reach it to the promised land. We have a choice we don't have to take the bitter. We can make it better through Christ as we put our trust in him. As we live on this earth, we are going to be presented with bitter times, but the sweetness of Jesus Christ can make it so much better. As he prepares us for this place of rest, this heavenly dwelling that he's called us to. Now, how's this accomplished? Well, it's all done through Jesus Christ. We don't, it's not our own efforts. It's only him. For by grace you have been saved through faith, right? This is, this is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may, may boast. He offers this to you because he loves you. The, the, the scriptures say that, that Jesus fulfilled the promised Messiah. He, fi he fulfilled it by, according to the scriptures, dying for our sins and being buried. And then, according to our scriptures, he was resurrected to a new life that we also could have as we put our trust in him. If you've never done that, today's the day.
If you've never done it, you know, we have these little uh, cards. Fill it out, and we'll, we'll follow you up with you. But don't let this moment go to waste. Don't make the same mistakes of the Israelites and choose a bitter life. Choose a better life. As he's chosen you, receive him and his spirit and his love. Would you bow your heads, please? Heavenly Father, I, I'm so thankful that you give us this word, this Old Testament word that still is true today as when it, was, when it, was, as when it took place we understand and seek to understand its meaning and try to apply it in our lives, I pray that we would not be satisfied with the bitterness of this world, but we would yearn for the better world to come and the better world that is now through your son, Jesus. He's promised that we could have life to the full. And so we take that promise and ask that you would fulfill it in our lives. Forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness and prepare us to be your prepared people for a prepared place, this, this place of rest that you have promised. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Please stand. And so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to for grace to trust him more the faith you have is by grace do what the disciples did they called out to Jesus and said increase our faith as you leave this place as you shut off the screen as you drive out in the parking lot there will be a plethora of opportunities to give in to the bitter don't do it choose Jesus and choose the better Please be seated. We're going to dismiss from the back forward. And as you go, God bless you and go in his peace.